we are going to move on to our next speaker, which is Wendy. Wendy, uh, she's the Deputy Head of Education at the Institute of Biomedical Science. Um, she got a very interesting surname, Wendy Leverset? Leverset. Leverset. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, she got a degree in Biomedical Science from the University of the West of England. Where is that? Bristol. 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 Um, and sh yeah, after graduating, she worked in the hematology lab for nine years, um, gaining a master's in bi biomedical science, completing certificates of expert practice in leadership and management, and uh, training and um, became a laboratory training officer. Um, and this experience as a training officer encouraged her to apply for the role as deputy head of education at the Institute of Biomedical Science. Um, right now, her role is to support guidance to laboratories and candidates undertaking IBMS qualifications, review courses with the aim of awarding IBMS accreditation, and manages the day-to-day -day, um, processes of the education department. So, welcome to Wendy. Thank you. Um, so, I've been asked to talk about um, HCPC registration and then the role of CPD. Um, so um, HCPC registration is really key if you're interested in going to work in the NHS as a biomedical scientist. Um, so hopefully you, HCPC has been mentioned a little bit earlier, hopefully it's a term that is not completely unfamiliar to you, but it stands for the Health and Care Professions Council and it's the regulatory body for the UK for a total of 16 health and care professions. So one of which is the biomedical scientist, but there's 15 other professions that this organisation also oversees. Um, it also includes clinical scientists, which has been mentioned earlier as well, but there's a whole range of professions going all the way from um, uh, down to some social care workers. So the whole point of this is they're set up for the protection of the public. So it's the patient at the end making sure that the service they're receiving through the NHS is safe, appropriate, um, and that everyone's going to receive a high level of care should they ever need it. It's required for the NHS. Um, it's a legal requirement. There's no getting around it. If you want to be a biomedical scientist, these are the guys you need to register with. Um, and in doing so, they have protected the title of biomedical scientist. So you cannot call yourself a biomedical scientist unless you're on this register. So how do you get onto this register? Um, the key thing is the HCPC standards of proficiency. This is um, what you need to demonstrate you meet, you fulfill in order to get onto that register. Um, and it's a long list of things that you need to achieve. Um, they're kind of divided into a set of generic standards, which are applicable to all of those 16 professions. Um, and they're, they're, they're generic in their standards, so it's things like how to be a professional, how you conduct yourself to understand the ethics when you're dealing with patients, data protection, all those kind of things that doesn't matter what job you're actually doing, it's applicable to everybody. Um, and then you've got another set of standards which are profession specific. So there's a specific set of standards which are for the biomedical scientist. If you were looking at one of the other professions, there would be another set of standards that are specific for um, social workers or for clinical scientists. Um, and they are relating to your individual and professional responsibility, service delivery, and it comes down to the fact that you've got the knowledge you can actually apply that knowledge, so you've got the understanding and application of it and the skills that go with it. Um, so one of the ways the Institute allows people to demonstrate that they have met the standards of proficiency is um, what's called the Institute Certificate of Competence. So in order to achieve the Certificate of Competence, it's essentially in two parts. And the first part is the academic side, which is the accredited degree. So this is why it's really important if you want to get onto the HCPC register that you have done an accredited biomedical science degree or as Sarah mentioned the healthcare science degree there's a there's a couple of titles around but the accreditation is key um, it's not the end of the world if you're not on an accredited degree and you still want to do this there is a way around it but it's far easier to just have the accredited degree to start with so if you've got that you've ticked that box um, and it, there's a specific standard which um, demonstrates you've met that 
The other side of it is to do a practical training session in the laboratory. So you've now got to, you've sat in a lecture theatre, you've listened to your lecturers, you've gone through the um, laboratory practicals, you've got that pool of knowledge, you've now got to go into the real world in an NHS laboratory and apply it. And this is where you can do something called the um, IBMS registration portfolio. And this is just um, a little snapshot, it's, it's one page of the registration portfolio, there's lots of other pages in the portfolio that you have to do, but they're based on the HCPC standards of proficiency, and what the Institute has done, they've taken the, the actual standard, which is that grey box at the top, that's the standard of proficiency, we have then interpreted that and applied it directly into a pathology laboratory. So. Um, you know, things like the first one, understand the need to practice safely and effectively within your scope of practice. How does that then relate to a pathology, pathology laboratory? How are you going to actually demonstrate you've met that? So we've then come in with the knowledge standards. So you, we've actually said, well, in order to be able to achieve that, that particular standard, you've got to know this. And then we've got a competence box at the bottom, which is where you've also got to be able to do this. So you've got to have the practical skills and application of that knowledge. So um, the registration portfolio covers all the standards of proficiency um, and it follows this um, same format. It's generic to all trainees, so it doesn't matter what discipline you're doing this registration portfolio in, um, it's, it's non-discipline specific. So you can do it in haematology and still, after you've done this, still go off and get a job in biochemistry. Or, or any mixture that you do. You can do the, some laboratories have a training program set up, so you, you will do a bit of the portfolio in chemistry, you'll then go into haematology and spend three months and do another chunk of the portfolio, you'll go off to histology and do another chunk of the portfolio. So all the evidence that you're compiling and all the knowledge and skills you're, you're getting is um, pathology-wide. So you really get a good understanding of how pathology works, all the different disciplines in it, and it really gives you um, an opportunity to, to almost try out every area of pathology and decide where you want to go off and specialise in after you've done the portfolio. Um, so this um, portfolio allows you to evidence that you have met all those standards which are required for registration. On the flip side, for the laboratory staff who are actually having to support your training, this portfolio gives them a template as to how they're going to help you out because it, it works both ways. You're putting an awful lot of time and effort in when you're in the laboratory in order to finish this, port this portfolio, but the laboratory staff are having to go away and make sure you can do all the right tests and have all the right support, and they, they need to know exactly what they're supposed to do with you. So this provides them a template of what they need to work through in order to make sure you're covering all the areas that you need to. So that's the registration portfolio. Just to link it back to how the Institute and the HCPC work together, we're two separate organisations. Um, the Institute of Biomedical Science is the professional body and the HCPC is the regulatory body. So we are two separate organisations but we, we do work very closely together and we complement each other. So the HCPC approved the Institute to do a couple of things which link to registration. So the HCPC have approved us to issue our Certificate of Competence. So if you've got the IBMS Certificate of Competence, that is recognised by the HCPC as being suitable to apply to go on the register. So if you've got that, the HCPC are happy that you have ticked all their boxes and met all their standards of proficiency, and you're in a place to just apply to go straight onto the register. They also allow us to evaluate degrees. And this comes back to if you've not done an accredited degree and you've done a non-accredited degree but you still want to get onto this register and, and become a biomedical scientist, you can apply to the institute and um, you, set, you send in all your module descriptors of the course you've done. So the, the minimum entry level is the um, a BSc honours degree. You send in all the modules you've done, we then evaluate, we have a, a set criteria we're assessing against and check what have you actually learnt, what do you need to learn and where's the shortfall. So we will, um, the outcome of that assessment is that you have either learnt everything you need um, or that you've got to go away and do particular supplementary education. So it might be that your degree, non-accredited degree, didn't actually cover haematology and that's what you've got to go away and, and learn. 
So that's the way you can you can still get onto the register if you if you haven't done an accredited degree, and the institute is um, approved by the HCPC to do that process. The other thing to remember is laboratory training has to be done in an in an IBMS approved laboratory. So um, if you also want to do any other institute qualification after you've become registered and you want to do the specialist diploma or something like that, then um, they take place in IBMS la approved laboratories. Um, and that's where we're checking that the laboratory has all the right facilities in place, has a training program, has the right test repertoire to support the qualification you want to do. So that's another thing that you need to be looking for if you want to go into a laboratory and do a, the registration portfolio or another institute qualification. You need to check that the laboratory is approved for training. If you're in a laboratory that's not approved for training, then that m may or may not be a problem. Um, there's nothing stopping any laboratory applying for institute training approval and um, will review their application. And it just depends on what qualification they're looking to do as to whether they've got the right framework in place to be able to support that. But um, we'll always um, do our best <coughs> to support the laboratory to, to get to a point where they can get approval status. So now we move on to continuing professional development. And this is um, something that you will probably be doing in one form or another, whatever career you will end up in. Um, the kicker is that if you're on the um, Health and Care Professions Council register, it's compulsory. You have to do this if you want to stay on that register. Um, there's, there's other reasons to do it as well, which we'll go into. Has anyone ever heard of CPD? It's something you've come across. Yay, some hands up. That's nice. Um, it stands for Continuing Professional Development, and you'll find if you Google it, um, lots of professional bodies offer a form of CPD, a scheme that allows you to record your CPD. Lots of people have their own <coughs> definitions and interpretations as to what CPD is. But essentially, it's where you've, you've come out of university, you, you've, you've spent all that time learning, you've got this huge pool of knowledge, it doesn't stop there, you've got to keep on learning. Science especially is a constantly evolving field. Um, Sarah mentioned about um, genomics and genetics and molecular pathology is an upcoming area. You've always got to make sure you're continually on top of all the new <coughs> developments, new areas that are coming up, and that's part of CPD. You can't stay stagnant in science, and CPD is a way of making sure you keep on top of that. So why should you do CPD? Um, there's lots of reasons. Uh, first is political. Um, you've got to remember if you're a biomedical scientist, you are providing a service to the patient. And one day you're going to be on the receiving end and be the patient yourself. And you want to make sure that anyone within that, that, that network that is providing you service as a patient is doing their job properly, giving you a really high quality service, and that you're safe. And that's one of the reasons. So if you've got somebody who registered X number of years ago, things have changed since then. You want to make sure that they know what they're doing now and that not that they used to know what they were doing 10 years ago. That's part of CPD. It also links to evidence-based practice. So you want to make sure that the, the treatment program you're on, the drug protocol you're on, um, is actually working. And, and that comes back to you need to prove that it works. You need to be informing how you move, uh, do your developments based on proof that you can demonstrate it's evidence-based practice. You then got professional requirements, so it's standards of practice. Um, when you come to work in pathology, there are things, um, there's pathology accreditation, and they're looking at how the staff are supported and managed, how the staff are demonstrating they're doing CPD. You've also got licensed awards, so if anyone's heard of the Science Council, okay, but, um, that's something that you, um, I suggest you all have a look into, because that's another thing that would be available to you. Um, there are different registers through the Science Council. They're voluntary registers, so it's not to be confused with the HCPC. Um, but it's, um, I'm on a Science Council register as a chartered scientist. Um, but you, there's two other registers. One is a registered scientist, and one is a registered science technician. So you can um, have a look at what's available there. And if you're on those registers, you need to do CPD. And then also it should link with your personal development through your appraisal um, um, and regulation requirements. I'm being given a countdown in the corner, so we'll whistle through these last <laughs> few slides. 
Um, CPD links to fitness to practice, it's kind of what I've mentioned already. You get to that initial competent state at registration, but you need to continually demonstrate you are continually competent and things change. Something that you've learned 10 years ago is no longer valid. You need to stay up to date. So what to consider? CPD activities can should always be individual to you. You're the one who knows what you need to go away and update yourself in. What do you need to learn? Where are your strengths? Where are your weaknesses? So it should always be linking back. The CPD I do will be different to what Sarah does, be different to what Ian does, to Helen does. We all have different needs and requirements. So it should always link back to what do you need to achieve through your CPD. What, what, what is CPD? What does it count? Well, it's going to a journal club and discussing a paper. It's um, attending a meeting like today. Hopefully, you'll have all le learned something by sitting through the talks this afternoon. That would be CPD. Um, it's getting involved with doing other qualifications, networking with other people. There's various ways you can get involved with um, the Institute as a professional body. We, we require our, we thrive on our membership getting engaged with us. So there's various roles you can get um, involved and they all count as CPD. There's also some, um, the further qualifications that have been mentioned earlier, the, high, the specialist diploma, the higher specialist diploma, doing an MSc, um, things like journal-based learning, where you're continually reading research papers, making sure you're staying on top of your field. Um, and then we come on to reflection. Um, and reflection is where you have done a CPD activity and was there any point in doing it? So hopefully you all came along today with the aim of learning something. Um, you've now sat through this afternoon listening to what we've all been saying. The reflection is now you come out and go out of this and leave this afternoon and think about did you actually learn what you needed to learn? If you didn't, what are you going to do about it? Are you going to go away and email into the Institute to ask a question? Are you going to come and find us afterwards to talk about something? Um, did you learn everything? What, have you, what are you going to do with it? How are you going to apply that knowledge? Otherwise, it's just an afternoon where you sat in a lecture theatre, hopefully not fallen asleep. But, you know, it just it ends there. And the whole point of reflection on CPD is that you're actually going to do something with it. Um, so it's about... Um, informing your learning, it, it will also help inform what you then do for your CPD as the next activity. There's just some prompts here um, which can help you focus in on, on how to do your reflection. Um, why did you choose to do this activity? Was it useful or not? Has it resulted in a change in your working practice? Is there a follow-up? And just the last slide, just to say that there are, we've already touched on career progression. There's so many different opportunities out there. There's lots of different areas you can go and work in. Um, with, it, with regards to various qualifications, you've got the academic qualifications. You've also got various professional qualifications. It really comes down to what do you want to do with your career, identify what you want to do, and that normally informs what kind of um, qualifications you then need to go and undertake, what kind of um, learning opportunities you need to access. And that's it. <laughs> Anyone got any questions? Yay! I got a question. <laughs> um, how long is the training uh, you have to do before you can uh, be registered? The, how long does the registration portfolio take? Yeah. Um, um, everyone's different. Everyone learns at their own speed, so there is no minimum or maximum time that the portfolio takes. Having said that, we do typically it takes 12 to 18 months to finish. Thank you so much. Okay, that was it for the talks we had today. And this